We built a lot of the staging before they rolled it up right, or parbuckled it. A lot of the words we use are Old English. Parbuckling or rolling it, we built the stage that it landed on. We had two accidents on that job, both related to racing Vespas, scooters in Italy. So, it's good times. <laughs> so, there we see, uh, you know, it's actually 79, do the math here, it's, it's well over 40 years now, but uh, we, now that we're owned by Moran Environmental, we have uh, kind of sister diving companies on the East Coast and in the river system. So, uh, a little bit more work out on the Outer Banks in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, it's kind of fun. That's me, I'm the little one. <laughs> I grew up in Lincoln City on the coast. Uh, my dad was a city planner there, worked on coastal management. Uh, my big little brother now, he's littler than me. Uh, you know, grew up crabbing on the Salette's Bay. Uh, everybody watched the movie, Sometimes a Great Notion. Yeah. Gotta love that. Rough, rough little part of the world that's always fun to grow up there. And, as a little kid having a boat on Devil's Lake and going up the river. But it kind of uh, solidified what I started doing. Uh, I went to college, and then I went to sea. Uh, I was driving tugboats to Alaska. You can see it gets a little get cold there. <laughs> That's a two and a half inch steel cable coated in ice. Uh, it's really only in the 20s when salt water starts to freeze on contact. So it's not super cold, it's cold enough. Then I, uh, I ran away. I went down south. I'm not sure if that's the right theirs, but uh, there's my boat. Uh, I didn't stay very long. When you're in the bayou of Louisiana and you're trespassing, you don't stay around too long. But uh, offshore in the Gulf of Mexico, working for a Greek oil company down to South America, driving basically a mobile office all over the place, seeing a lot of places that I can't afford to go to. So then I went back to school. I got a graduate degree from NYU, and I decided to take off and drive some yachts to see some more places that I can't afford to go to. <laughs> but like Newport, Rhode Island, very beautiful, amazing place. Uh, I wrecked the place, but there we go. I'm even wearing a uh, Dutch Harbor sweatshirt there just to prove my lineage. All right, so then after that, I took a little sabbatical and I came back to the West Coast. So up here, ask a question. What is a salvage master? Is there a school? What are the qualifications? It, has no school, it has no qualifications, it is a point of reference. Anybody can say they're one. So basically it becomes more of a trust issue between your employer. Uh, there's a few books here I'll reference. Uh, Hungry as the Sea is one of the dime store novels about marine salvage with the excitement. And it's, a, it's an interesting read, it's, it's not realistic but <laughs> <laughs> so you'll see this as a joke all over the place ship salvage is a science of vague assumptions based on debatable figures from inconclusive <laughs> instruments performed with equipment of problematic accuracy by persons of doubtful reliability <laughs> and of questionable mentality <laughs> so uh, there is more to this reference book here. The captain of a salvage vessel is said to be a man who knows a great deal about very little, and he goes on knowing more and more about less and less until finally he knows practically everything about nothing. <laughs> the chief engineer, on the other hand, is a man who knows very little about a great deal and keeps on knowing less and less about more and more until he finally knows practically nothing about everything. <laughs> the salvage master starts out knowing practically everything about everything and ends up knowing nothing about anything due to his association with the captains and engineers. <laughs> That's from another reference material. A 
salvage engineering book from the American Society of Naval Engineers. <laughs> All right, move on here. So some history going way back. There's been laws about marine business and insurance for thousands of years. So uh, Hammurabi, Rhodia, basically laid out what people would get paid if ships were lost or what you should pay someone working on your ship. It, it's been part of humans forever. In the Western world, old Edward Lloyd started a coffee house. All the shipwriters, or should, shouldn't say underwriters right away, but uh, ship owners, captains would get together there and drink coffee, discuss business, trade stuff. That's where the term underwriting comes from. You would have risk, you would sign your name under a boat, you would pay to get money back if it was successful, but together you shared the risk if it was lost. So you physically would write your name and put your money where your mouth was and underwrite the name of the vessel. So, shared risk, insurance clubs, uh, that still goes on today. Uh, there's the Nordic club, the Swedish club, all these clubs where you're sharing that risk, and that's basically, we do this for money. So, the money for our jobs comes from these historic things. Uh, there's different houses. The boat pulling machinery is one insurance house. The P&I Club, the Protection Indemnity of Third Parties, is another part of this house. Pollution here in the United States is a big deal. Cargo is another house of insurance. So if you own a boat, you better check all your riders because you might have different underwriters for different parts of your insurance and something might not be covered. Just a warning, I don't own a boat. <laughs> so uh, cargo convention of low lines, old Plimsoll. Everybody know what a Plimsoll mark is? It's a load line on the side of a vessel. He was a British politician trying to protect the sailors. He said, I wrote this down on the plane to make sure I got it right. So the ability of ship owners to insure against risks <coughs> against their ships and crew is itself the greatest threat to safe operating. So he thought if the owners could just insure the ship, it could degrade, and who cares about the sailors, you get your money back. Mm -hmm. So part of that was him making sure there's a safe load limit <coughs> openly marked on all the ships. So, Plinzel Mark, he's out there, that's the 1800s. Uh, that continues on for international stuff till this day. Uh, general average, that's where everybody, including the cargo, shares the risk. You'll hear that, like it just happened in Baltimore, that ship ran right around. The pilot just lost his license last week forever. They said general average. So every container on that ship paid for part of the salvage. Uh, everybody uh, read Farley Moab. He's a good Canadian author, talks about the sealing industry, but he writes one called The Gracie's Under. Awesome book about a salvage tug history of having to run out and do pure salvage. That means no formal contract, throw in a line on the boat, helping them out, hoping you get paid. And I'll start making sure I'm not a historian, that's for sure. All right, keep on moving. Pure salvage. That's when you don't have a contract. You do it for whatever you're gonna be awarded in court. Lloyd's Open Forum, that's international, so that's a Lloyd's Open Form, it's two pages, and a salver will often get a captain to sign that. Uh, there's no such thing as just picking something up or putting a line on it and it's yours. It all goes to arbitration, <coughs> unless you're a pirate. <laughs> That's the reality of it. Uh, contract is more in the US. Every vessel will have a response plan that will name somebody who's supposed to be your salvage provider, your for your uh, marine firefighter. A lot of this is gonna come into play here with OPA 90, the Oil Pollution Act. You can see the Exxon Valdez there happened in 89. OPA 90 came out the next year. It created a trust fund. That's when the Coast Guard can open the fund and pay for pollution salvage. 
<clears throat> Solid Marine firefighting. If you really want to go to the CFRs, the Code of Federal Regulation, it's good reading. <laughs> <coughs> Nairobi International Convention on Remov Removal of Wrecks. This is new. It used to be that we, once it wasn't polluting, a lot of wrecks stayed there. There's a lot of wrecks up in Alaska that are still there. Uh, that's, that's changing now. We're starting to have to remove all that. Uh, Marpool and Solis, kind of laws internationally that kind of pushed all this information and makes our business a little better. That's the Marine Pollution Act and the Safety of Life at Sea. Solis, uh, how reactive we are. Solis was started after the Titanic, when you actually had to have enough boats for everybody. And that kind of pushed uh, the rules that we're in. I'm not a lawyer, just making sure everybody. All right, we're going to get some pictures here real quick. All right, so we are a diving company. So a quick history of diving, right? Uh, diving Bell, everybody go see the Vasa. It's in the uh, yes. Yes. great museum. All right, so we went from Diving Bell to surface support, which is what we do. We have a hose to our divers. The closed system, a rebreather, which is hard to believe that was really first before the open system. But then the open system became popular after World War II with old Jacques Cousteau, right? So we took the stuff from these other Frenchmen and developed that during uh, the occupation with the Germans and France. All right, mixed gas. That's when we actually change the air we breathe and try to get rid of the nitrogen to stop the vents. So if you're ever around saturation diving, they all sound like Minnie Mouse, even though they sound like me. They're breathing a percentage of helium to get that nitrogen out of the system. Saturation is called that because you can't get any more of that into your system. <coughs> so the way to decompress has nothing to do with time, only depth. Mm -hmm. Enough chemistry. I'm not a diver, but you can read that book, Trapped Under the Sea, about the Boston Tunneling Project. One of my supervisors was one of the survivors. So let's, let's roll here. There's a big crane, a derrick. All right. There's a big chain going under a wreck. There's a tugboat that's been sunk for five years. That's a very heavy tugboat full of mud. That's 542 tons clear of the water. There's it's on the barge, and here's a scale reference. There's me and the propeller. And what do we do with it? It goes to scrap. So that's a state project in Washington. That's a derelict vessel recovery. All right. So is it a salvage or is it a wreck removal? Different ways to get paid, different ways to operate. So uh, we're going to do an assessment to see if it's a total loss. And uh, I think up there, actual loss. If you can't find it, it's an actual loss. <laughs> uh, constructive total loss comes from the military when they actually say, is it worth rebuilding or you just leave it? So uh, proper survey is always a good start. They make the best skiff, helicopter, and plane trips. There's probably a little difference there. So. Can we land the helicopter there? I bet we'll fit. <laughs> I was in the back seat and actually leaned forward because I thought it would be better balance when we tried to land there. <laughs> That's off Kodiak, Alaska. This is me in a Chinese longliner. The physical differences between that crew and a Scandinavian might be a little different. <laughs> This is the Kolek oil rig up in Kodiak. I was helicoptered there after they pulled the crew off. I asked for an engineer, and because it's the size of a city, and uh, they said it was too dangerous to put the engineer back on. But I can fix that. <laughs> and that's a liability. That's that's a liability is that the company already said it was too dangerous for the crew. So even if it wasn't, they couldn't backtrack. What do you do when you're working around polar bears? You land the helicopter on the barge so they can't get you. <laughs> this is Hudson Bay, Upper, upper Canada. <laughs> it's my crew in Sitkanek Island. 
going to work, there's giant stellar sea lions around there, so it's kind of fun to, when they're the size of your skiff. <laughs> this is me uh, in Unimac in the Blutians, watching two foxes try to take a whiz on my bear gun to mark their territory <laughs> while I'm surveying a wrecked fish boat. This is me uh, on Palmyra Atoll, a thousand miles south of Hawaii, going out and uh, surveying the wreck on the beach and get sunburned. Vancouver Island, see the bear tracks leading right to my helicopter. They were like 20 seconds before the helicopter came to pick me up. So, wow. <laughs> Ralphie. Yeah. Some, I, I send this to management each time I get sent on the survey. <laughs> All right, so pollution is a huge deal in the United States. After Open 90, uh, the government, the U U.S. Coast Guard, the state entities that are going to push this as a, as a primary push that pollution, and it's important. So this is a diver working in black oil on a job in Alaska. It's, uh, it's pretty horrible, but uh, something we have to get done. In the international scope, uh, the scopic uh, special consideration for those no cure, no pay jobs, then the environment still matters. So if you don't actually cure the salvage job, you'll still get some money for stopping the pollution. Some of you might know like the Torrey Canyon or the Amico Valdez. These are the, the huge wrecks in the 60s that kind of pushed this in the international market. All right, so Salvage Engineers, my buddies, this book. <laughs> Engineers don't like, maybe, should, could, might. They don't work in that, but they do with us because everything's already broken. So a lot of times, like this job this morning, how much does it weigh? How hard do we have to pull on it? I don't know. Take what you knew before, what the loss is, make a good guess, go big, bring a bigger tug, bring a bigger crane. Uh, so naval architects, I work with them all the time. Our numbers, if it's a big job, and the stakeholders include the federal government, CERT is the U.S. Coast Guard team. Andy Lawrence is the civilian who runs it back in the Beltway in D.C. I talk to them all the time. They're going to be asking me what my thoughts on the weather and the tide, the ground reaction, that's the friction that the boat's going to have. So all of those numbers, they're going to say, how many tons per inch of water are going to be required as you go up the side of the boat to refloat it? And I'll say, I don't know. I'll, I'll give them a good guess, but I could say the tide's going to be higher tomorrow, the weather's going to be worse tomorrow, we've got a good chance. Uh, historical documents, we'll be looking up Library of Congress to get the plans for the boat, because half the time the plans were on the boat when it sank. Uh, interviews with the crew, if possible, uh, liability of the crew talking to us, sometimes we don't get to get talk to them, it's just... Uh, basically a deposition we might get to watch. So again, the reading list is beauty. <laughs> All right, I'm not an engineer. <laughs> All right, so first case study. Some of these are a little old, but I, I mentioned depositions and lawyers and stuff, so some of the newer stuff I can't talk about. Um, the Chevelle, Newport, Oregon. <clears throat> right now, the Dungeness fleet is going out there and risking their lives for crab. You see that every day. I was kind of surprised that I didn't get a call because almost every year I have to go after a boat at this opening weekend, right? So this was a no cure, no pay, because you can see the boat's breaking in half and it did. So the bow stayed there and the stern floated away and I don't think they ever found it. And if they did, they won't say anything because they're liable to pick it up. So we hired a local. A couple little tugboats, and we went diving. You can tell by the mouth there that it's summertime. There's almost no swell. So we cut rigging holes with a uh, underwater exothermic torch, or BROCO. It uses magnesium, oxygen, and electricity to actually burn through steel underwater. It gets so hot that it separates the water molecules, so you have to watch your vent 
because you'll get hydrogen pockets and you'll blow yourself up because water, of course, is O2 and hydrogen. All right. So we had to airlift some sand out and we attached these big balloons, lift bags, buoyancy bags, external flotation. And that's us towing under the bridge. Coast Guard wasn't, let's say they're not happy. They like that it's gone, but moving the boat like that up the shipping channel, you have to be really careful. So we've got some, some extra stuff going on there. Extra reserve buoyancy, a secondary boat, a security boat keeping the weekend warriors away from our tow line. <coughs> Coming in. Real careful about transferring the load to a crane. You're going from buoyancy to overhead lift. Actually, you hooked a truck up to it and drug it inshore to get our chart closer on the crane because we don't know exactly how much it weighs. It's the front half of a boat. It's missing some parts. And a little levity. <laughs> <laughs> try to be funny sometimes, it doesn't work. But the, there's what she looks like now. There's some scale, the crew on board. You can see the chain rigging positions. This is where the diver cut through, and specifically cut through where the deck meets the side shell, so it's a strong point, and these chains were hooked into the bags. And that's how we float, something that shouldn't float. That's another Carly par Moat boat, the boat that wouldn't float. <laughs> All right, second case. This is up in Alaska, in the peninsula. This is a tugboat and a barge, both aground, 400 yards apart. <laughs> There's about, a, oops, let's go back. There's about $11 million of seafood freshly caught right there. Generators are still running. Tugboat's here. If you notice, the water's supposed to be up here. Yeah. It's a bootstrap. Bootstrap, by the way, bootstrap bill, you know, that's, that's the change of the paint between the bottom anti-fouling and the top side paint, it's just bootstrap. All right, so. Lots of fuel on the tug, some on the barge, containers, freezing temperature, ice. So we've got, first thing, take fuel off. How much do we take off? The Coast Guard wants to take it all. I say, don't, I need to run the machinery on there. The Coast Guard says, take it all. I say, no, there's conversation, we get to keep some. Same thing on the barge, I need to keep the generators running. Keep that crane swinging these containers too. This is a landing craft. So at high tide, I started swinging containers. I started defueling. I started to get more equipment coming because you're in the middle of nowhere. You're in between King Cove and Sand Point. And if you haven't fished up there, it's nowhere. It gets cold, freezing salt water. Uh, offshore, I've got another tug and barge. This is where I'm putting the containers. So this guy's just doing round turns offshore and every high tide, those landing craft bring him a couple more and a couple more and we start cranking through. You can see here, bubble. That barge is ripped up. It's not gonna float again. I'm still gonna refloat it. Just I'm gonna have to force air into it to do it. That's what I say over here. All right, so I got all that. The containers went to Dutch Harbor. The client got all its fish back. We saved, we salved, you know, $11 million of seafood, probably all in Japan. I pulled the tug off. I'm up there above the tow winch. I've got a wire going out and I've got a, another tugboat yanking it to break that friction, that ground force reaction. So I've got constant pull, what we call beach gear kind of pull. I've got a tugboat trying to break that friction. And it's the most disgusting sound to be a boat captain when you hear that steel rip across the rocks. But she's refloating. This is my dive boat. We're diving on it. Make sure she won't sink on us. And then we got her under tow and got her out of there. So to the village of Sandpoint, if you haven't been there, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's the side of the barge. So my guys in their dry suits, hopping around at low tide. It's a little wreck. So I brought in these air pumps and we hooked it up and we sealed the top of the barge and we put it on a bubble. So it's like a cup, you push down into the water, a 
whole bottom can be ripped off. We're still going to float it. These pumps came from old Fred Devine in Portland. It's no longer in business, but uh, at the time, I still rented their gear. My crew was living in a container on there. There they are. There's our card table. It's a good time. We had one container for sleeping and one for playing cards on watch and keeping those air pumps going because if they failed, the barge sinks under you. <laughs> Which meant that I had to follow the barge in our dive boat. This is an 80 foot dive boat. That's my bow going through a 20 foot wave. That's the spin drift at 100 knot the wind. So it's not a very comfortable ride. In fact, those 150 foot landing craft, because they don't have a keel, were getting blown off and had to run. So we had to stay with them because we were the egress boat. If it did sink, we got to pick up my crew. All right, so there's the air coming out of those hole, <laughs> hole right there. There's the air coming out, so we're pumping to keep her afloat. That's me. When I grounded it on the backside of Homer's spit, they tried to fix it. They tried to sell it. Stayed there for a year, and they finally cut it up for scrap. So like I said before, 14 out of 15 of the sections in that barge had free passage. So only one corner actually held air on its own. The rest of the barge either had a hole in the bottom or you had transmission through the inside bulkheads. So the, the walls were fractured. All right. I think this is hilarious every time. <laughs> I don't know if Ferris chasing children. <laughs> you just watch out when you're there. All right. So both those cases were covered and financed by the owner's insurance. So that goes back to our history of insurance uh, and not our government programs. Here's a couple cases over in Ilwaco. Uh, the Lee Hugh tuna boat that I think bounced up and down the coast, it was in Warrington, and then Ilaco, and then it sank, and I had to pull it out. That became a derelict vessel uh, taken care of by the state. So that was, a, that was a government program. I carry a little plastic figure of Carl. He's a cartoon character for scale from Aqua Teen Hunger Force, if you're a fan. But, uh, so my little uh, cartoon character for scale, usually around rigging to show the size of rigging there he's watching what I'm doing. The other side is the Coco. You can see that he missed the channel and got on the old uh, train trestle mm -hmm. going by the Coast Guard station in the Ilwaco. Mm -hmm. And um, trying to figure out how to get that unstuck. Mm -hmm. But we did it and there we're towing it into Ilwaco with Coastal, your local guy here. And uh, that was an insurance job. So the two different sides of, of what's going on, and in that job, first thing was to get the fuel off, the pollution carrier, and then to get the, the hole off, that's the P&I, the protection and indemnity carrier, and then see if the owner got any money back for the hole and machinery, because the boat's worth something in his policy, hopefully. All right. So, the tourist two. <laughs> Everybody remembers oh, yeah. that that came in. Uh, when I was in college, I was the captain at Argosy Cruises when I was going to UW. Mm -hmm. And I knew a lot of the crew who had captained that up there when it was called the Kirkland. Mm -hmm. So when it did sink, I made some telephone calls and had teams meetings about where the fuel was, where the vents were, what we could do to get the fuel off because we were hired by the Coast Guard under that trust fund under the OPA 90 law. It allows them when there's not an owner that has resources to go and do something. So we did, <coughs> and we did uh, penetration dives inside the vessel to empty the tanks and secure the boat. And then basically you had a stall or a wait until someone figured out what to do with it. We generated some plans. Uh, basically, uh, Additional sampling, something that is the, the modern world again, hazardous materials of a vessel prior to 1980, we're looking at asbestos, PCBs, lead paint, 
everything that's probably killing me. Uh, those mesothelioma commercials late at night, right? <laughs> uh, so going back in the history, talking to the crew, like I said, historical, and uh, get an idea of, of what we needed to do if we were asked to remove it. And we were asked to remove it by Oregon State Lands. They're the, the leaseholder, the landholder of the leased land that it was on top of. It's their responsibility. There's no apparent ownership with the means uh, to do something about it. So working with our partner Advanced American out of Portland, we put up a security barrier for pollution and the floating beams that would come off of this when we have to physically break it up. And that was a decision. You know, when we're talking about plans, do you try to lift it? Do you try to refloat it? Do you break it up in situ, in place? Well, uh, she had landed on the old burnt pylons, so there was a bunch of forks through her entire side, and she was floating, partially buoyant, up and down into those and just opening up that entire side as the tide went in and out. So uh, the other thing is the engineering analysis. Is we thought she'd be about 300 tons to lift. Nobody in Columbia River has a 300 ton crane. And then you gotta develop a rigging plan that will support or cradle that boat as well. And then on the tail end of that, you gotta think, what do I do with it now? So. Basically, the decision for the efficiency and the financial reasons was to break it in place. It's, it's a sad end, but uh, sometimes you gotta go. First, first bite. All right, so the next day we got the house off and she is partially buoyant. She's rocked loose from all those piles she's stuck on and she's almost floating flat at certain tides, which kind of, <laughs> it's unexpected. I don't expect something to, to float like that, but uh, I don't think you would have floated that boat out. I think she was still touching something down there. It just looked interesting. All right, there we go. So everybody knows the tide runs like hell here, right? <laughs> So every day during that slack and a little bit of the flood, <coughs> we're working to remove as much as we can. And then when it starts to turn before it gets away from us, we clean the water surface, we send the divers in, they secure anything on bottom, they reattach any of the lines so we don't miss anything, and we don't leave the site until it looks like that every day. There's a diver going into the pond, a skip box, so he's actually on bottom picking up pieces to make sure we don't leave anything behind. We took some stuff that wasn't ours, a couple truck axles, a bunch of fishing gear, probably some stuff from the pier upstream that fell in just before that that won't be named. Um, and a lot of the, the burnt cannery pieces there too were, were loose down there, but doing everything we can. Uh, the mountain, of debris there, you see the engine block, and the, propell the propeller, important that we're getting everything that we think is there. Uh, and then also the piece of overhead that initially was flushed inland and kind of speared on the, on the piles way in shore. All right, <clears throat> more words here. So I think it was the right decision. I have broad shoulders, I'm not afraid of the decisions I make most of the time. Uh, so just the garbage and the recycling came up to over, it's probably just over 220 short tons. So I usually add a percentage, 25 is actually pretty low for water weight that would be in the tanks and in the wood when we try to lift her. So yeah, it's pretty close to the engineer's estimate of about 300 ton lift, it might have been more. Uh, so I think that's probably a conclusion that bringing in what would have to be a five to 700 ton derrick to be able to lift that and reach out and put it on a barge is not cost effective. Uh, there's not many of those resources on the west coast of the United States. 
Last time I used one in Anacortes, I had to get a Jones Act waiver to bring it out of Canada. So that's like an act of Congress to make a pick. Uh, and then the liability, like I said, what do we do with it after? And I've got it. Who's going to take it? Uh, it's unfortunate that um, I think that say the fate was was sealed there when it when it slipped through the bot. So, all right. So I had some time. Got a couple minutes here. So I, I put in a couple other cases. This is Palmyra Atoll. It is a thousand miles south of Honolulu. It's five and a half degrees latitude. We got to ride a Gulf Stream to get there because it's there's no fuel there, so you need an aircraft that'll go a thousand miles each direction without refueling. Conveniently, there's also a wreck of an airplane right back there, so it makes you really comfortable. <laughs> uh, we're moving three wrecks. The, the biggest one is a long liner where the crew. Chinese crew ended up uh, beaching it there trying to get asylum. So uh, that didn't, didn't work. Uh, but we had to cut it out. So by diver, there's Billy, he's cutting. Here's the wheelhouse coming free of the water. Lots of boobies on that island. And at night, if you turn the, the lights on, these are mantas coming right in and, and they give you a little vibe. They'd come by and they'd sweep right over your hand. So Palmyra International Airport, there's no, nobody lives there, but the Nature Conservancy has an outpost there. So there's a science station. You can go there if you're a big enough donor. I donated 90 days of my life to go there. Um, and the sea will tell. There's a reading list. This is about a murder that happened there. Yachtsmen went there, and one of them coveted the other guy's boat, and they killed him for his boat. My engineer, sense of humor, right? Gave me that book with a note that said, for your upcoming vacation. <laughs> As I was getting on the plane to Honolulu. All right, so here's underwater shots. This is our offshore barge. So we built what we call a jack-up barge. We float that out there, and then these legs, we hydraulically push them down into the reef and get above the swell. And then our divers go to work cutting lots of fish. But you can see the diver here is cutting this piece, this big piece of boat, comes up to surface, and gets put on these little mini barges to go over the reef back to the lagoon. We end up removing 500 tons of material, a million pounds. Um, technically here, hopefully this. So this is Broco, this is underwater burning. See this off-color gas? That's your oxygen hydrogen from his torch separating the water molecules. You do not want a pocket. It'll sound like big bass booms and sometimes it'll blow the diver up. Oh. All right, so this is uh, just recently up in the San Juan Islands. It's a fish boat that sank in 240 feet of water, initially in 140 and then it slid down the cliff. Uh, it's kind of a, a new thing for us to remove a boat that deep. This is not usual. It's a new precedent because it's very expensive and, and pretty dangerous. Uh, this is, we're breathing mixed gas. We're not going into saturation. The divers get to come out of the can every day, but it takes about four hours to clear after a 30 minute dive. The tide runs up to five knots, so we're usually only doing one dive a day. Otherwise, the diving bell will get swung under the barge. Came up to surface a little heavier than I thought it would be. Ended up to being 143 tons clear of the water. So I said, go big, 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 big crane, right? 400 ton crane, we're good. Uh, the weather, and uh, I hope there's no swearing or anything. But uh, sometimes you got to run, right? So you see how big that block is? It's a 400 ton crane block. <coughs> These little guys up here, me. So let's let's watch this video here. Where, when do you got to run? Well, you run them like this.
time to go home. <laughs> yeah, you're done for the day. <laughs> all right, I think that's all I prepared. Got them right on, right? 45 minutes? Yep. All right. So many photos, that was awesome. Um, we have about 15 minutes left for questions, so if you just want to raise your hand, I'll come around with a microphone, and please make sure that you speak into the microphone so that we can all hear your question. Thanks for your talk. The SS Central America, <laughs> the SS Central America that sang out the Carolinas with all that gold from California, the salvage, I don't know what you call them salvage people, they were obviously gold hunters, uh, but they brought all that gold up. Is are any of the techniques they used those that are common in your industry? And, and what do you know about those? Folks? So uh, I think he just got caught, right? He was running from the law because he didn't pay his investors. So he, um, they use a lot of remote vehicles, right? And we have a remote vehicle team. Uh, Absolutely, that technology is getting better and better and we're gonna be diving less and less. That's the reality. Uh, use them all the time. I've got a job, I'm supposed to be on a phone call trying to take oil off a yacht off of uh, Monterey. Here, we, we tried salvaging it, we failed. I don't fail very often, I don't like that feeling. But yes, that technology, the ROVs, remotely operated vehicles and UAVs, the un, unmanned, are, are going to be bigger and and every oil rig every offshore rig has one to do the work and keep our divers safe uh, that gas job in 240 feet the rov was watching them all the time so we get another camera view uh, i talked about it this morning real quick we call it martini depth at a certain area like 100 foot when you start to get to more atmospheres, it's like drinking a martini. So I have to make my job list super simple for the diver because he might be three martinis in <laughs> just in uh, oxygen narcosis. Like he's, he's basically getting tunnel vision and he's out of it a little bit, but that's what those machines are coming in. His ability to take that gold, talking about, remember there's nothing's just nobody's. It might be abandoned, still has an owner, that insurance cooperative might still have a, a claim on it. Odyssey is a publicly traded uh, gold entrepreneurial business and they still, I know that they've had to like run out of Spain before because the, the government was like, we need that percentage of that is ours. So absolutely an interesting story. There's a great book again. I. I'd say everybody read everything you can, so. Well, I have one with the a $40 gold piece. How much did it cost? I don't know, I bought it, it was used. <laughs> but I was wondering. Don't come to my house now. I'm coming, Stan. I understand there's more and more containers that are floating that have fallen off ships. Do you do much in the way of salvaging them or what happens with them? Absolutely. So the red helicopter picture with the bare feet, I spent six weeks in the wilds of North Vancouver Island picking up pieces of the 109 that fell off the Zim Kingston off of Victoria. Uh, only four made it to shore, but I'm sure that about 40 or 50 of them opened up and anything buoyant spit out. And so that's an absolute thing. And that's, that's when each cargo carrier is gonna have an insurance company associated with their cargo, not only for the value of the cargo, but their indemnity if it goes overboard. And a ship like that will often do that general average where everybody pays for part of it for me to go up there and play with bears and helicopters. But that's one thing I love is I get big toys <laughs> and I don't have to pay for it. But scheduling, I had four helicopters, bunch of Canadians, 
poutine every night. <laughs> but absolutely, it's it's a big big deal, and I've uh, it's it's going to be even more with these huge ships. The bigger the ships get, uh, the more dangerous it's going to get salvaging them and the, and the containers. Uh, I had one that was floating around British Columbia by Bella Bella. If you ever been there, it's a great little place. Um, it was floating like four feet out of the water. Ended up as 2,000 cases of Lay's potato chips floating in a 45 foot container. So I went and towed it in. So it's, it's, and politically, trying to get rid of garbage in Canada that hasn't been brought to Canada legally. I was up there for like three weeks trying to figure out customs what to do with this. So that's part of the job too, is that, that side of it. And it's just gonna be more and more. I gave a lot of them away. <laughs> I burnt the rest. Well, my question is, give me a little advice if you've got a son wanting to have a family like he wants to be a salvage driver. Family? Yeah. <laughs> I haven't really been home in five weeks and that's working locally. Uh, we're a regional company, probably have more of ability with a regional company than say a major, like the ones who are on the ship response plans, like Smith, Don John, or Resolve, or, or those guys, but uh, salvage isn't uh, full-time as far as the divers go. Divers have to be like a, a multi-tool, so my guys, there's certain guys I like to work with, but if we're not active on the salvage, they're gonna be doing ship husbandry or construction to be full time. And that kind of stuff is a little bit more local, but I have to go where the work is. Nobody plans their oil spill next Tuesday in Walford. You know, like, uh, I wish they did, but uh, I should say that uh, it's not the easiest when it comes to that, that's for sure like being a fisherman maybe, or even a, a, a normal sailing type. But do uh, you guys do much work on the, on the dams and the gates and that sort of stuff up there? I, I know that they need divers up there too. Yeah, and that's exactly it. That's the other side, the, the construction and the husbandry side uh, of, the, of the divers until you get into ineffectual middle management. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But it's, you know, our guys are, are craftsmen, they're tradesmen. Uh, my guys are union, part of the Pile Fucks Union. So we're gonna be working on those dams and those spillways, like we said, that we built one in Kentucky for the Corps of Engineers. Uh, and that was, that was a solid, you know, there's guys who bought houses out there because they were there for five or six years, even though the company's out here on the West Coast. You mentioned uh, Sitka Knack Island. What were you doing on Sitka Knack? I was removing a wall boat. Uh, I was removing a limit sander steel hull. It was a no cure, no pay uh, wreck removal. That's part of uh, something we do after the, the boat is a constructive total loss. The insurance companies will ask for bids to remove that wreck. Uh, the whole starboard side was ripped out. So I ended up uh, filling the boat with billets of foam so it couldn't sink, then pulled it with the biggest tug I could find, and it, I pulled on it for four hours with 80 tons of force for the 8,000 horsepower tug, and it finally let loose and shot off the beach and immediately rolled over to negative 115 degrees. I cut the mast off of it and I towed it 300 miles through Shelikoff Strait back to Homer and scrapped it. And that's, that's where, you know where that's at. It's at the end of Kodiak Ar Archipelago, and it's, uh, it's on the very southern point there was where the wreck was, so our weather windows were very short, and it's rough territory. I did hire an excavator from the cattle rancher who lives out there with his family. So I used a big landing craft and moved an excavator from one side to the other side, and 
fought battles constantly with the foxes. <laughs> but uh, that was a, a no cure, no pay wreck removal. And that's, that's a pretty common thing as far as the insurance companies who want a pure price to do it or you get nothing. It's gonna be a higher percentage because I have to build in all my liabilities like weather, equipment failing, seasick, whatever it is. Uh, but the insurance company knows that it's gonna cost five million and they either do it or they don't get anything. The one change to that is the environmental side on the international market where pollution now you can get a percentage uh, basically for even a no cure, no pay, if you stop pollution, you can still get some money even if you don't do the job. You mentioned unions. Could you speak a little bit more about that? In sure. Culture and you know, how widespread. So the majors are not going to be union. The regional companies might be. Uh, that's something that, that the industry offshore isn't going to be a, much of a union job. Uh, the oil industry, a lot of that stuff, of course, doesn't want it. Uh, our divers are all like up north 196. I'm not sure what the house is down here, but uh, for us, it allows those guys, because they don't do it every day, so it allows them to have work full time in these other parts of the industry. And then when I call on them because something happens, my crew, I get to come in like a pirate to these regions and be like, I need this, I need that. I need this, but those guys are doing stuff for PG&E in, in uh, California, or they're doing stuff at, at the port here, uh, driving pile, fixing docks, cleaning propellers, and so uh, it's a good wage, and they get good benefits, and uh, I think it, it works out pretty well. Offshore, some of the stuff, we, we do have some provisions where we have to make sure that um, like traveling offshore with a barge that has a load line, and this is what I'm doing in California right now, that they've got housing on the barge, we have to watch the union rules and make sure that their time off is their time off, and I'm not asking them to splice a line when they should be racked out and sleeping. But uh, it works pretty well. I, I don't have too many complaints. Every once in a while, the, the premium time on a no cure, no pay job, you know, might hurt the company line, but I don't worry about it too much. We do pretty well. All right, we have time for one more question. Uh, while you uh, rushed out here to, to rescue the ferry situation, there was ironically two salvages being prepared in Portland in the full view of the city by the I-5 bridge, which I understood had taken years to put been there for years. Did you know anything about that and how it, it transpired? Sure. I'm pissed I didn't get to work. <laughs> uh, we had done the pollution response for the Coast Guard while they were both still floating and had initially done survey work. And at the time, uh, that work was awarded without uh, any opportunity to put in a bid or a proposal against it. So. It was done well uh, because I have union divers. Uh, some of them worked on that project because they they got hired to do that job and I got some phone calls about it and I don't really like giving too much technical information to, a, to another company, but they did it and they did it safely and those boats are, are being handled. Uh, a couple of years ago, we took like 20,000 gallons of oily water and diesel off those boats. So. Absolutely, before they sank, they were a nightmare, uh, environmental nightmare. And uh, I'm glad that they're out of there. I wish we had done it. Um, although my ego might be a little crushed by that, I was happy that some of the guys called me to ask some questions and that's, that's good on them to, to keep themselves safe. Uh, so they also had, speaking of having to bring in a big crane, they had to bring in a big crane to do the lift there. And uh, you know, that's, they probably burnt 
half a million dollars just on the tugboat fees to bring that in from Puget Sound. So speaking of you know having to bring in a crane like that for the ferry here, you know that would have been well over half my budget for everything just to do the tugboat to bring the barge in. So big equipment like that is really, really handy, but really, really expensive. But I think they did the right thing and, and they used that oil spill pollution trust fund uh, to lift the boats out and then it went to Oregon State Lands to do the final cut up and get rid of the material. It might still be going on for, I don't know. <laughs> I know they're up there in the diversified shipyard. All right, let's give Chris one last round of applause. She is an author and a historian who's going to be talking about the impact of the fur trade on local sea otter populations. And the title of that presentation is What Happened to Oregon Sea Otters? We also have a couple of adult education classes coming up for February. So there is a Sailor's, Sailor's Valentine's Charcuterie class. That's coming up on February 10th and 11th. You can join us over at the Barbie Maritime Center and craft your own Sailor's Valentine. That would normally be made out of seashells, but in this case, it's gonna be made of meats and cheeses and mustards and all that good stuff. And um, we also have a Yotaku fish printing class that's gonna be the weekend of Fisher Poets on the 24th and 25th. So you've received member emails about that. If you're curious and want more information about those events, you can also go and talk to the front desk and renew your membership if you need to. Thank you all so much for coming, and hopefully we will see you all again next week.